Hello, I'm Mary Killen, and I'm at the Idler Academy today to help you to gain social confidence and to teach you all you need to know about some of the most difficult areas of social life. I'm going to give four lectures. The first will be on drinks parties, the second, dinner parties, the third, house parties, and the fourth, conversation and flattery. I want to help you to gain all the friends you need and the ones that you can feel most happy in the company of. There's no point in recruiting friends with whom you have no compatibility. Once you've started to recruit friends, you may wish that you hadn't because friends have become something of a plague species. We've got too many of them. We all have too many now. The good thing is that Professor Robin Dunbar at Oxford University has recently come up with a theory which has gained full plausibility in scientific circles. The Dunbar number states that no one can have more than 150 meaningful relationships as the brain is not evolved enough to process any more neocortically. Don't uh, chastise yourself for having more than 150. Um, don't feel guilty about it. You have to work them off, as we say. One way of working off a so-called payload of people is to give a drinks party. A drinks party has a number of advantages over a dinner party. People don't get trapped between two others. You can circulate freely. It only lasts for two hours, so you can um, you know, it needn't rob you of your entire evening if it's no good. But you should go with the correct attitude. Go to a drinks party thinking, I'm not going to make any kind of fantastically profound connections or have any amazing conversations. You will just be talking in platitudes. Accept that. A drinks party is there for the purpose, you do the groundwork there for full interchanges with others in house parties and at dinners and on walks. What you go to a drinks party for is to exercise presenteeism. It doesn't matter how witty and clever and powerful you are, if you're always in your own flat watching things on your laptop, people will forget about you. Going to drinks parties is a bit like speed dating for you and for the people you meet. It allows you to um, sort of absorb the atmosphere of the other people and tune in rather like they do at speed dating. They can tell immediately if they like the other person. You too can just sense whether somebody's on your wavelength or not like tuning a radio, but only if they're actually in front of you. So it's a very important duty for somebody with a lot of friends to give a drinks party because look at it this way, for 500 pounds, you could buy a ticket to one charity event. No doubt it would be useful to the charity, your money. But for the same money, you could have 100 people Half of them will be reformed alcoholics and the other half can have 10 pounds a bottle wine. You can make 100 people very happy for 500 pounds. Ideally, you would have waiters, but they're not entirely necessary. You can have a counter at one end of the room with drinks on it and let people help themselves. In some ways, that's just as good because it allows people to get away from others they have been trapped in conversational cul-de-sacs with. It's very important to invite all generations. Don't just have your own age group. That could be a disaster. You want middle-aged, old-aged and teen and 20-somethings. The teen and 20-somethings meet useful contacts and they stop twittering and talking rubbish. The middle-aged people feel, I'm not quite so past it as I thought, because look at these much older people. I'm better than, I'm less decrepit than they are. And the very old people are thrilled to be in the company of the young, exuberant, sort of vital 
people who are glamorous. Never have a 50th birthday party with only other 50 year olds. The Vieilles Dore are a very important group to include in a social event. Just as the young once had the upper hand, the Vieilles Dore are now um, <clears throat> the most sought after in terms of social desirability. This is partly because their characters and intellect were formed in the days before media pollution, when brains were active questers rather than passive receptors. Consequently, their conversation tends to be high caliber. Such people also have lived, compared to people born after, say, 1960, have lived at a tempo where thrills were actually thrilling and boredom was actually boring and romance was much more exciting because there was none of the barnyard quality to romance that we have today. You can take a tip from those old people and the way they concentrate when they're speaking to you and listen to what they have to say and learn something from their civility and general superiority to those of us who came after. Another formula that's very successful, three men to every one woman. I know it sounds silly and difficult to achieve, but it isn't. If you ask every female to invite three men, um, and they needn't be people that she's attracted to. The other females, if every female invites three men, that's about right. You can see this formula successful because at public schools, co-eds, they always have a policy, one third girls, two thirds boys. Otherwise, some weird syndrome takes hold where the men become wimps and the women viragos. Marlborough College, for example, adhered to this policy and it trained someone good enough to attract and be ladylike enough in the company of the future king. Go early to a drinks party. If you go late, it'll be crowded. You want, if you've made the effort of getting ready and going to the party, you may as well extract the maximum benefit from it. Arrive as early as you can and then leave you know, at eight. If it's six to late, come at six and leave at eight. Don't linger. The important thing is to um, realize that no one is thinking about you and whether you're inadequate or small or anything like that. They're all thinking, I wonder what she or he thinks of me. So put others at their ease by smiling, it doesn't matter if you've got nothing to say. You can do take a tip from the Queen and just say, have you come far? Now, to avoid being stuck in a conversational cul-de-sac, what you should do is bring a letter in your pocket, in an envelope. If the conversation gets sticky, you can always say, I was just handed this letter when I came in. Will you excuse me? I'd better look and see what it says. Oh my goodness, sorry, I, I better pop outside and make a call. Something like that. Otherwise, you can just carry on smiling pleasantly, but allow the gap between yourself and your interlocutor get gradually larger until people start to push their way through it and other people will um, divide you naturally. One tip a friend of mine uses when she goes into a party is to pick up two glasses and then she walks purposefully across the room as though looking for someone. If she sees people she likes, she can go and join them. If she sees people she doesn't want to be held up by, she can say, nice to see you or talk for a couple of short sentences and then move on as though she's trying to deliver the second glass. Now, I myself find if you go to a party where you know you're going to know too many people, you are going to cause more, make more enemies than friends if you can't talk to all these people, particularly if you're important. So 
what you do is you arrive, but you stand very near the entry point. The people flood in. Hello, how are you? Very well, nice to see you. No more than 90 seconds, because they themselves will want to surge on in to access the drinks. Also, they will feel the seething crowd coming up behind them. So that's one way of processing the maximum number of people. And, you know, it may sound boastful, but many of us know too many people. Nicholas Coleridge, the British chairman of Condé Nast, calculated that by the age of 42, he'd already met 25,000 people. You need to plan ahead when you go to a drinks party. Inevitably, people will want to go out to dinner after it. Now, you mustn't make the mistake of hanging around till the bitter end to see who's left and who wants to join you. One, there won't be a table in a restaurant for the number of people you've rounded up, probably about 10. And also, everyone will get tired and irritable while they wait for the slackards to leave. What you do is you say, in advance, you ring somebody before the party, Will you, do you want to have dinner afterwards? Yes. Okay. So you arrive and then somebody you don't particularly want to have dinner with comes up and says, hello, Mary, who are you having dinner with? Should we have dinner? And then I can say, oh, well, Rory Stewart is giving a dinner for me afterwards. But I think he's, you know, he's asked everyone, so I can't invite you, I'm afraid. He might go up to Rory Stewart saying, can I crash your dinner? Rory Stewart can say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know that you'd be available, and I've only got a table for six. Ideally, um, some people who feel that they might be... Um, <clears throat> irritable by the end of the evening. Some people, especially the pregnant, eat before the drinks party and then they can stay to the bitter end, really enjoying it because they're not feeling hungry or faint. Um, a friend of mine who has, um, is a well-known comedian finds that at the end of his gigs that he just goes home because otherwise it would be divisive. He can't, when people say, who are you having dinner with? He says, I'm just going home. And in that way, he gets out of hurting anyone's feelings. One woman I know who gave a drinks party suddenly realized at the last moment she was catastrophically short of men. This was a small drinks party. She had a brilliant idea, costly, but and only, prob on, only possible if you live in London. She rang up the agency doctor call and ordered three doctors to come. These three doctors, of course, are all very urbane and sophisticated young men, and they made delightful company. There's also the tutoring agency, Bright Young Things in London, which boasts a huge number of graduates, sophisticated, charming. Why not try and hire some graduates if you're really desperate? If, for example, you're trying to help a goddaughter who's just come to London for the first time, doesn't know many people, you could do a lot worse than to hire some possible friends from the tutoring agency as a starter guide. Two hours, 40 pounds an hour might, yes, quite costly, but they may give you a group rate reduction. Now, one of the things that happens is you go to a party and you cannot think who on earth that person is walking towards you smiling. What do you do? This afflicted a man I used to work for, an editor, who was always causing huge offence. He eventually got round it by always carrying on him a petition to save the Barnal. It meant that when he saw familiar strangers coming towards him, he was able to say, stop right there before we say anything. Let me get you to sign my petition to save the Barnal. And then the person, of course, he said, can you write your name in block capitals? And then it was fine. I mean, it looks a bit corporate, but if you do want to issue people with sticky labels with their names on it when they come in, you can always say, it's we've got a lot of geriatric guests here, the vieillesse dorée. 
and they can't remember who anyone else is. It's a marvellous excuse. Everyone loves it, especially girls who see handsome Adonises, want to know who they are. Then they can just read their name tape. Do them on a post-it, peel off sticky thing. At a drinks party, remember that you really shouldn't have more than two glasses. I'm sorry to be depressing, but if you're going on to a restaurant afterwards, you'll have a further two glasses there. And you really don't want to make yourself ill or dehydrate yourself. Try and stick to two glasses. The way to do this is to just take the most tiny sips of your first glass, spin it out for the first hour, then throw it back, get a second glass and do the same with that. Otherwise, the waiter may keep topping you up and before you know it, you've had six or seven units and you're talking rubbish and people are moving away from you. Occasionally, one guest will drink too much and start to become objectionable. There are various ways of dealing with this, but I've had success myself with the following method. I've taken the offender aside and whispered, I've got something so interesting to tell you. I've got to tell you in private. Come with me. I've then led that person to a bedroom and said, just sit on the bed. I'll be back in a minute. I must just go and get a glass of water. To stand outside the door for about 90 seconds, any drunk on a bed will fall asleep within minutes and you can leave them on the bed until the party's over. Drinks parties should never be open-ended. They should always have a definite cut-off point at which they end. Otherwise, I'm afraid, you run the risk of people becoming drunk and objectionable. And for this reason, two hours is usually the maximum that you should um, expect your guests to stay. A certain way to encourage people to leave is, of course, to hide the supply of alcohol. Once they are sort of revved up and ready to go, if they look around the room and there's no more drink to be had, they will automatically make their own way to the next watering hole or restaurant without you having to be so um, crude as to say, will you go now, please? As obviously you don't want to ever do that because you want to be hospitable. So the best thing is for the drunk to think it's their own decision and their own idea to leave. One thing that spoils parties these days is the terrible, torturous high heels that women feel they ought to wear. Now, I recently went to a party where 600 magazine women had gathered <clears throat> at the Bishop's Palace in Fulham for a farewell party for an editor. All of them were on shoes at least six inches high. All of them were in agony. Um, but if everyone else is six inches higher than you, it's understandable that you would feel you should wear the high shoes too. One woman I know has got around this problem in the following way. She arrives early at the party in a paper, brown paper bag, from a bookshop is a brick. She stands on the brick in the corner of a room. No one notices. She just stays there all evening. People come and go because they can see her from far away because she's so tall. And they come and go and chat to her, yet she enjoys the full comfort of her flat Manolo Blahnik pink suede brogues. And I would advise anyone who feels they can get to a party early and stand in a corner to do that because it's humiliating to have to take off your high shoes halfway through or spend a huge amount of money on a taxi there and back when you could easily save the money and put towards giving another drinks party yourself. At a drinks party, you're sometimes talking to one person whose name you've forgotten when another person whose name you've forgotten comes forward and you're forced into the position of introducing them. I think the best thing to do is just to say, you two will have to introduce 
each other as I get very flustered at parties, then nobody minds that. Of course, if they're wearing their name badges, there's no need to worry about it. Now, some people find it very disconcerting that the young, now double kiss, new people are introduced to for the first time. What should somebody over 30 do when this happens to them? Just passively allow them to do it. Some of them do it, it seems to be a fashion. There's no need to recoil from the unsolicited intimacy. It's all very bubbly and meaningless. Should you shake hands with people you've just been introduced to? Yes, of course. You have to make that connection. And what's more, you may also find there's a little secret message coming from the physical contact that helps you even more to clarify whether you are compatible with such a person. Somebody wrote to me once saying she was giving a drinks party for some very shy teenagers and she wondered how to break the ice and make it go with a swing. I advised her to hold the party in the studio in her garden. It had a wooden floor and she was able to masking tape off the floor into numbered squares. She was then able to issue the children as they came in with cards, rather like dance cards, 10 names, had to be calculated carefully beforehand. When the bell rang, you had to go and stand in, in square 10, square 20, square 15, whatever, and you had to talk to that person until the bell rang again. The teenagers complained bitterly as they arrived, but they very quickly got into the spirit of it, and they loved it. Teenagers love structure, and they have nothing to say to anyone, so they adore it when they're forced to make conversation, you know, by, by compulsion. Masking tape can be used on an ordinary carpet or seagrass to create the same effect. The idea is to have, say, five 10-minute conversations and then allow them to circulate freely at the end, by which time the ice will have been broken. One of the most terrible mistakes somebody can make at a drinks party is to look over the shoulder of the person they're talking to. Now, when I'm out and about, I say, oh, have you met so-and-so? Very often people say to me, by way of criticism, yes, he is, yeah, he appears to be quite nice. However, he's the sort of person that's always looking over your shoulder at a drinks party, looking out for somebody better to come in so he can move away from you. People seem to be very offended by this. Now, it's illogical because you go to a drinks party for the purpose of interacting with as many people as possible. Of course you want to know who's coming and who's going. What if your own sister who you haven't seen for a few weeks is about to walk in? But you have to do it more subtly. Speak, concentrate on the person you're talking to, stare into their eyes and really listen for a little burst in fact, you don't even have to listen as long as you're staring into their eyes. Then every so often act as though somebody's bumped into you. And in your return sweep, you can take in who else is in the room without causing offence to your interlocutor. Drinks parties are important for many reasons. Getting people together, having the dynamism, the floor space, it's all part of your duty to give such parties if you're capable of giving them. Because the more sort of bonding that takes place, particularly romantic bonding, the better. And many people are trapped in offices where there is no romantic potential whatsoever, particularly the sad girls who work in magazine buildings. Younger people for example, those at university may wish to give parties. The trouble is, who's going to pay for them? One of my correspondents wrote in to say that while at Durham University, he 
often gave a drinks party because he had plenty of money. However, um, other people who didn't have money would give bring a bottle parties and find to their annoyance that it was always the richest students who didn't bring a bottle. Now, they didn't mean any harm. It was just that they weren't used to bringing bottles. So my friend Philip Wood, the correspondent, came up with the solution aided by me. He gave buyer bottle parties. He went to an off license and bought on sale or return um, Bulgarian Cabernet, which was acceptable in those days, and Eden beer. He'd then issue an invitation, come to a buy a bottle party, H14, the castle, Saturday, that sort of thing. When people arrived, they'd be required to give five pounds. In return, they'd get a bottle of wine worth, say, eight pounds. So they were still being hosted to an extent, but it meant that they could or two bottles of beer, the same amount, but it meant that they could avoid making themselves ill by switching wines or drinking low quality wine. So that was quite a practical solution and you might consider it for if you're a student yourself or someone with limited income. Book launches and art gallery openings are a different type of drinks party. There's really only one rule about a book launch these days, you must buy a book. The publishing industry is in such decline that it's really your duty to buy one. And in fact, most of the largest numbers of sales often take place at the opening parties. You must keep this wonderful tradition of book writing going. And in your own small way, I hate to be spelling this out so graphically, but if you're going to drink 12 pounds worth of wine, you may as well buy a book at 15 pounds 99, as you'll still be, you'll still have had two hours of entertainment out of the event. At a gallery opening, ideally you will look at the paintings on show. Some people feel they can't go to a gallery opening without buying a painting, but I think that is not a requirement. It's just that the super rich feel they have to buy one. The ordinary member of the public is just there, or friend of the artist, is there to swell the numbers, bring a bit of gaiety, be social polyfiller. And it's nice to go to a gallery opening because there's something for you to talk about. I hope this information has been useful to you. In my second lecture, I will be focusing on the difficulties and delights of dinner parties.